Hello and welcome to Artifacts, the monthly arts magazine on City Cable 34 here in Minneapolis. We're going to be looking at a lot of images. Uh, later on we'll have Jan Marlies from the Minneapolis Arts Commission. We'll be talking about some of the public art, both downtown and in the Minneapolis neighborhoods. But first we have a guest here from the University of Minnesota Press, its director, Lisa Freeman, and we're going to talk about the uh, University of Minnesota Press. So Lisa, thanks for coming and joining us. My pleasure to be Glad here. Glad to have you here. Um, Let's just get a little bit of information about what the University of Minnesota Press is and where you are and what you do, and then uh, I want to talk about some of the books and things that you've got coming up. Right. Well, we are uh, a nonprofit, scholarly publishing uh, company, in effect, uh, attached to the University of Minnesota, founded in 1927 by um, the then Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. Um, we're housed within the Office of Academic Affairs, and we publish books of a fairly wide variety, uh, both academic books and also books for the general audience. Okay, so you are very much part of the fabric of the University of Minnesota? Very definitely. Uh, we publish books by Min University of Minnesota professors, although we also publish lots of books by other people, and we uh, work very closely with the faculty in the university in developing our editorial plans and making decisions about which books we'll publish. How do you do that? I mean, there must be many, many ideas that people come on, in with, with for uh, books to publish and, and that. Indeed. How do they come to you and how do you decide which ones to pick up? Well, we, we get up to uh, several hundred proposals a week, uh, unsolicited proposals that come from all over the world, really, for books of uh, every variety you can imagine, from uh, children's books to poetry to spy novels to uh, more typical university press books. Um, we have a staff of three full-time acquiring editors who uh, handle respectively the social sciences, the humanities, and the natural sciences. Uh, they spend a good deal of their time traveling, talking to people, and developing editorial plans, in effect, uh, trying to decide where there are interesting things being done and meeting people. Uh, so that's a major source of, of the books we, we eventually publish, um, in addition to the things that come in over the transom, as we say. Um, and then we also talk with faculty and people to try to determine what's happening in a particular field in history or geography or psychology. Okay, so some of it is sort of research and, and you Indeed. go out and We, we um, spend a great deal of time trying to figure out what's going on in the academic world. Um, and in that sense, we, we attempt to be a little bit ahead of things. Um, a lot of this is done at academic conferences. Uh, I'm on my way to the American Sociological Association meeting and there'll be 4,000 sociologists from around the country there giving papers and presentations and um, we then try to find out you know, what's hot in sociology in effect and uh, uh, also uh, follow along on, on things, uh, current events. Uh, I'm sure this, uh, this meeting will be dominated by things going on in the Soviet Union. I can imagine. Have you ever published anything uh, about or by uh, the Soviets? Um, we actually um, have had one or two uh, books published um, about 18 months ago, published a book by a man named Bogdan Dennett called The End of the Cold War, ironically enough, um, which uh, received a great deal of attention. New York Times Book Review, we were cited uh, in quite a lot of national uh, news about it, uh, discussing, uh, in effect, at the time he wrote it, predicting the collapse of Eastern Europe, although as the, the book was published, most of the events had already taken place. Um, and we have also, uh, in the past, done a couple of co-publishing arrangements where we've published um, science books written by, uh, in this particular case, Herb Wright, who's on the faculty here at the university, um, with a Soviet publisher in Russian. Interesting. Uh, so we have done some, some work, uh, as have uh, a number of other presses. It's been difficult because there aren't too many resources. Well, that raises a question, and certainly something that's on the edge of breaking news with the Soviet Union and something like that. What's the lead time? I, I, I'm sure it's different book by book, but right. on average, between uh, the submission of an idea and mm -hmm. when that book is out? It, it depends a lot. The review process takes a couple of months. Um, all of our books are read by other experts, um, arranged by the press staff. Um, the reviews are then presented to our faculty committee and a decision is made about whether or not to proceed with the project. Some books then go straight into production and others require revision and additional research. Mm -hmm. Um, from the point at which we get it and it's ready to go, it's about 12 months, depending on how complicated the material is. The end of the Cold War, which I mentioned, we produced, I think, in five months, but that's, um, that means everyone's putting in a lot of extra hours and uh, doing things on a, on a fairly breakneck schedule. Now, you mentioned a few of the folks that actually review the books that come in. There are, what, three of them, you said? Well, we have three editors handling different areas. Oh, they're, areas. they're sort of the contact points. And okay. then, then we have a whole network of people around the country who then 
uh, work as peer reviewers who are um, mm. commissioned to read a particular manuscript for but us. But in, in your press or at the University of Minnesota Press, how many folks work and what kinds of things they do? We have 30 staff people um, divided roughly evenly in four departments, editorial acquisitions, the editors and the support staff, uh, our business operations office, they collect the money, uh, the marketing department, um, which consists of advertising, publicity, direct mail, um, that is selling the books, and we've uh, put a lot more emphasis on that in the last year or so. And production, this is copy editing, proofreading, design, typesetting, printing and binding, physically getting the book into the... Where does it get printed? Is it done in-house? No, we do um, most of the development work, copy editing and design work is done with freelancers in the local area, but the typesetting and the printing and binding is done um, in various places around the country. Most of the printing is actually done in Michigan. Oh, um, there are a number of specialized printers there who focus on university presses. Mm -hmm. What happens, you know, we hear in the news the University of Minnesota may be going through some budget cuts and, and you've got a relationship, obviously, you're right. part of the university. What happened, what's the spin-off for you folks? Well, we have a, we're in a relatively unusual situation vis-a-vis um, -vis other university presses. Um, we have a relatively low level of funding from the university in comparison with other Big Ten presses, for example. Um, and so in one sense we're somewhat more insulated from budget cuts than other university presses. We receive uh, all of our facilities, the building and support uh, for the building from the university and some subsidy. Um, but we are largely self-sufficient uh, from book sales and from something called the Mul Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, which is the single most widely used personality diagnostic test in the world, um, originally developed by two University of Minnesota psychology professors. Uh, back in the 40s, uh, revised about 18 months ago, and that is um, an internationally known instrument in psychology research, and we receive a royalty from the company that So you hold the copyright? I take Indeed. Okay. Uh, and that produces really uh, quite a large sum of money, some of which we then use to fund back into uh, psychology and psychometric testing research. We, we in fact, have a small research program going. As part of the press? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's quite un fairly yeah. unusual for university press. And then uh, most of the rest, some of that revenue goes back to the university. It supports an endowed chair in the psychology department at the U. Uh, and the rest of it goes to helping sustain the book publishing program. So you contribute back into the field, at least in this case, back mm -hmm. into the field which came forward and that you published. Indeed, that is the idea. The, sure. the new test has had a, been very, very successful and, and uh, the income has gone up quite substantially. We've made the decision to earmark uh, upwards of a quarter of a million dollars for research and development for additional tests, um, something that would not be done on a commercial basis, which is really what we're all about. Um, we're there to try to sustain publishing that would not otherwise uh, take place if uh, profit were the only motivation for publishing the book. Right. Well, that leads me to a couple of questions. It, it, it's a fascinating field that you're talking about. Um, you mentioned the Minnesota multiphasic test, something that probably a lot of folks have either been affected by or maybe know by name. Anything else over the history uh, since, what, the late 20s right. that um, folks might have heard of or, or certainly in some of the topical areas? Well, probably one of our best known books is The Doctor's Mayo, which has been around for a long time, which is the biography of the Mayo's brothers, written by uh, a woman who then became the director of the press, Helen Claypsaddle. Um, from the rest of our backlist, there are various sort of classic Minnesota books. Birds of Minnesota, which is a lovely two-volume set on uh, all of the birds of the state. Um, there's a, a book that was recently serialized by the BBC, in fact, um, called Growing Up in Minnesota, which are recollections by various Minnesotans uh, about their, their growing up here in the state. Um, and we are now uh, making a real effort to try to get back into uh, the regional publishing side of things and to uh, encourage some some uh, publishing in the state that, that uh, has been going to other publishers or hasn't been done. Well, I think you brought a cover of a couple books that are coming up, one of which is new and one of which is a Right, paperback. we have uh, two titles coming up from the fall that we're particularly pleased about. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a cover for a book called uh, North Writers, a Strongwoods collection. The uh, editor is John Henriksen. He's a regional writer who's been around for quite a while. And um, it is various essays and uh, articles by people from the state on the natural history, uh, and particularly mm -hmm. on the region around Lake Superior. Um, we're very proud of that. And the other one is uh, Hubert Humphrey's autobiography. This is being issued in paperback for the first time ever. It's been out of print for about 10 years. Um, this is being done in uh, commemoration of his 80th uh, birthday, which was this spring. Um, that'll be out in the fall as well. And we are uh, planning a, a major uh, campaign to launch both of those as well as to promote some of our backlist titles with the Minnesota Historical Society this fall. So um, you'll see uh, some announcements about both of those. Great. And again, as you say, there's a, 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 
rededication to emphasizing the marketing and the Indeed. promotion and of your books. We're going back into our backlist and uh, reissuing some books that have been out of print. Uh, we've recently issued Leon Snyder's Flowers for Northern Gardens, which I recommend uh, as a new Minnesotan. I've bought a copy from my own garden. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Fishes of Minnesota will be back in print this fall, another book that's been out of print for quite a while. Rough estimate. How big is your backlist? Um, we have about 480 titles in print at the moment. Um, and something you've said before we sat down to talk here is that your particular press that you direct is a little bit unusual within the academic press community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, we've um, we've we have uh, spent a lot of time sort of looking at our mission in the last uh, year or so. Uh, university presses have um, seen their their traditional market scholarly libraries uh, erode quite dramatically in the last couple of years. Uh, a combination of cutbacks in library budgets. Um, libraries simply aren't able to purchase the number of books that they used to, uh, cutbacks in university budgets, presses don't have the kinds of subsidy levels they used to, and, and uh, all of us in the university press world are struggling to try to redirect ourselves. Um, we are making a very conscious effort to uh, broaden our base to publish more in the general market. Um, part of this is now going to be redirected into our regional studies program, which will emphasize the state of Minnesota um, and the various groups that live here. We do quite a lot of publishing with the Norwegian American Historical Society, for example. Uh, and we will also be trying to do more general interest books um, in contemporary issues and current politics. Um, I did bring another book, yes, um, like which was published this spring uh, called American Refugees. It's a collection of photographs by uh, UPI award-winning photographer Jim Hubbard, who's recently relocated to the Twin Cities. Um, these are photographs taken over 10 years of his career of uh, the homeless in America, and it's quite a, a moving book. I, um, I can't really speak about it as, as uh, effectively as, as looking at it. Can uh, you maybe uh, flip sure, through a little I bit? I think we can you, capture some of this Sure, I can show you a couple here. of the pictures. Yeah. Uh, these are a couple of shots of uh, two young boys in uh, Washington. Uh, the one on the uh, right is holding a starter pistol. The one on the left is watching his... Uh, house uh, and belongings be evicted onto the streets. The caption here on the right says, for many homeless children, games have given way to grim reality. Uh, this is, yeah. uh, is very true. Um, we've, uh, this has been a very interesting process for us. We were able to convince some of the people who were involved in producing it, the printer and the typesetter, to donate some of their time. Um, we've been uh, putting a lot of effort into publicizing it and uh, convincing people to use it uh, to give away to people in places who are in a position to to uh, perhaps do something to solve the problem. Well, Lisa, tell me this. Um, is it difficult to get a book like that published? I mean, that's topical and a little bit passionate, if you will. Indeed, and uh, it takes a lot of, uh, it took a lot of effort um, to get it together. It, it's, uh, from a production standpoint, it's very difficult. Uh, this particular project has an interesting history. Uh, Jim Hubbard had been invited to display his photographs at the Uptown Art Fair several years ago, and uh, when he arrived with the photographs was uh, told that that uh, it was felt that the photos were probably inappropriate given that the art fair was a, a celebration and an upbeat event and uh, this provoked uh, some discussion in the local media and was picked up on by the then editor-in-chief at the press, Terry Cochran, uh, who contacted Jim and said, look, we'd like to do a book with the photographs. So there's been a little bit of uh, concern around the photographs to begin with. Um, but certainly now that it's out in book form, we've had a tremendous amount of res uh, response and support from people um, in the bookselling community, in bookstores, libraries. So in some ways it sounded like your press had a response to the situation that Jim Hubbard found himself Indeed. in and said, we'd like to step up. And well, and again, we felt this was a case in which the material uh, should be out there in, in the public and people should see what's going on. And this clearly isn't a project that's going to be picked up by a commercial publisher. You're not going to make the New York Times bestseller list with a collection of photographs of the homeless. And we felt that that really was in keeping with, with our mission, which is very much education and outreach to the community. Lisa, we've got time for one more quick question. Um, who's reading University of Minnesota Press books? Um, a lot of people are reading them. I got a wonderful uh, letter from one of our press committee members who was on vacation in northern Maine and was in a bookstore and overheard someone come in and request a book we've recently published called In Their Own Words, which is a collection of uh, letters from Norwegian immigrants home um, during the last century. We sell a lot of books to the academic audience, but mm -hmm. increasingly we sell them to um, general readers who are interested in various of the subjects that we publish. Lisa, it's been fascinating. Thanks a lot for sharing My pleasure. what's going on with the University of Minnesota Press. And we'll be back in a moment, but first stay tuned for this interesting fact about the arts.
and welcome back. In this part of the show, we're going to be talking with Jan Marlies, who is the Art in Public Places Program Manager for the Minneapolis Arts Commission. Jan, thanks for coming by. Hi. Glad to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. Now, before we go in, we're going to take a look in a little bit uh, at some of the uh, public art that's out in Minneapolis, downtown in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But what do you do? Um, who are you and what do you do for the city of Minneapolis? Okay, well, originally I started out um, doing a survey of all the city-owned and city-funded public art. And that's completed and we have 406 objects documented and it continues to grow. Um, we have uh, Gateway's public art project that's coming up. We're um, doing 13 uh, public art pieces over the next five years. Sounds like one for each ward. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, the Hiawatha Avenue mural is going to be starting to paint um, next week. Okay, who's doing that piece? Sarah Rothholz Weiner. Okay. And that's a 29,000 square foot mural. It's huge. It, it's huge. It's going to be very, very beautiful. And where is it that's on South Hiawatha? Yeah, it's on Hiawatha Avenue and 41st Street. Okay, so people see that as they come in from the airport. Right, okay. right. It's a corridor. It is um, what is called the first gateway um, project for Minneapolis. Um, as an entrance, that's the theme of the Gateway Project, is um, um, signifying neighborhoods um, at their entry point into, the, into and out of the city. Well, we've got a lot of things to talk about, but as long as you brought that up, if a neighborhood or some folks are watching the show and they're interested in participating um, you know, in the Gateways Project, mm -hmm. how would they hear about it and what do they have to do to be considered as um, one of the neighborhoods? Yeah, um, both artists and neighborhoods alike that want to be involved in the Neighborhood Gateways Project should call the Arts Commission office and uh, we can put them on our mailing list and they'll receive all the applications for submissions for either being a neighborhood sponsor of a public art project or for uh, being an entering artist in our competitions because all of our public art work is, is run through competition. Okay, and you're not doing all of those at once. You're doing, what, a few this year and a yeah. few next year? And we have three this year that we're doing. Uh, we had the first uh, preliminary proposals hearing last week. Oh, okay. And where are the three that have been selected? Um, one is uh, northeast over on Central and Broadway Avenue Bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, one is um, the Elliott Park neighborhood, and that's and it's on uh, 10th Street between 5th and Portland Avenues. And the third one is in Powderhorn Park. Okay, so spreading out all over town. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's yeah. the goal. And then the Hiawatha is going to get some paint on the side of that uh, Yep. Mill up yeah. there, huge. Yeah, it's uh, silos that has cur curving structure all around. It's fascinating. Now, you mentioned you had done the cataloging of all the city-owned pieces of art. Now, that's from every department and agency, right. uh, the libraries, the health department, everybody. Correct. It's every agency throughout the city. And what kinds of things, I think when, when I hear that, I think of, uh, well, there's some paintings probably, oil paintings of some mayors mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. What all did you find in the catalog? Uh, well, there's quite an extensive uh, works by the WPA, the Works Progress Administration from the 1930s and 40s. And uh, there's a lot of paintings in the library that there's a lot of things in storage that I would like to get out of storage and up onto walls. Uh, for example, there's some Native American portraits um, that are worth quite a bit of money that are in storage, and I would like to take those and put them in the Franklin Library. Um, mm -hmm. Right now they're in storage at the Downtown Public Library. Okay, what other kinds of things do you find besides paintings? I mean, are, do the cities um, have fountains, we've got mm -hmm. sculptures, I know. Fountains, we'll see sculptures. some of those in a minute. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I found some hidden treasures in the park board, uh, some old uh, um, um, Neo-Renaissance uh, garden sculptures of uh, satyrs and pan figures, and they're real interesting, real fun. How does well, how did this city, I suppose every city is a little different in its mm -hmm. history, how did we get these things? I mean, does the city commission these? I know recently, of course, the Arts Commission has been commissioning pieces. Correct. Um, the Art and Public Places program has been commissioning just since 1985, mm -hmm. um, since the program started. Um, there's really, the, the, the most of the public art is donated that you see today, unless it's an Arts Commission project. There is one piece that we'll see, um, that is that was purchased by the park board and that has been the only purchase really oh that's interesting mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. well perhaps at this point we could uh, take a look at, at some of the things that i know the crew here <laughs> went out and uh, shot a variety of uh, the uh, pieces that are out and i want to make the point that these aren't all 
um, artworks commissioned or purchased or owned by the city, right. basically what we're talking about here is art in public places, some of which might have been, say, the bus bench project that the Arts Commission mm -hmm. done, but others are placed by uh, private businesses or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's take a look at uh, that tape. And why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing? Um, this is the Lumberman sculpture by Roger Brodeen, and the city have contributed funds to this. So it's a city-funded project, of, um, but it wasn't wholly purchased. And that's up in Camden, right? Right. And what is this? So the Pioneers, this is the one and only sculpture ever purchased by the Park Board. And uh, it's, it was uh, $28,000 back in 1936, originally located at the um, Gateways entrance mm -hmm. on Hennepin Avenue. Now this looks a lot more contemporary here, obviously, 1987. Yeah, this is an example of our neighborhood arts program um, where uh, community youth work with an artist to create a public mural or a public work of art. In. And I understand there are quite a few of these now in different neighborhoods around Minneapolis. Yeah, um, this, this particular neighborhood has quite a few. And this is, an, this is a 1991 um, Minority Ethnic and Neighborhood Arts Program Project where students work with artist Cheryl, Cheryl McRoberts to create these, this totem. And these are details uh, here of the totem itself. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful like. project. They turned a, a, a vacant lot into a garden. Um, the, there's a trellis and gardens all around the totem. This is uh, one of our BMFs, the bronze male figures that you see often in parks. Um, unfortunately, Ole Bull's violin bull get, keeps getting stolen. Of course, he was the classic Norwegian musician that brought uh, right. a lot of music sensitivity or sensibility to Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. where is that? That's in Loring Park. In Loring Park. And right. just across Hennepin Avenue here, yeah, Father Hennepin, um, actually this is, a, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about the survey and why it's important to document the park board was under the assumption that they owned this piece. However, that's incorrect. It was commissioned by the Basilica. Oh, interesting, back in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us about this piece. This is interesting. Uh, this is our, our first public art project which produced uh, four artist design benches along Hennepin Avenue. This piece was recently restored about two weeks ago um, by uh, Fine Arts Associates. Okay. And now here's a mural. I know this is downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a, an Arts Commission project. This is a private project. This looks fun. Mm -hmm. See that down by uh, Jukebox Saturday Night? Right. As I recall. And that's the same piece. Okay. Um, this is also privately funded sculpture. Mm -hmm. And obviously the, uh, the building there, which I think is on 5th Street, uh, commissioned this to be placed out in front. I know that particular enterprise has uh, an art program inside as well, which the public can walk into, into the lobby. Yeah, a lot of corporations have a, a fairly good public art program. Mm -hmm. um, this is The Entrepreneur by Dean Kermit Allison. And uh, he was unveiled for the groundbreaking ceremony for the University of St. Thomas campus on the, um, in May of this year. In the fall, it's going to be um, recited in the court, new courtyard of the uh, campus on 10th Street in LaSalle. And it's a symbol of the entrepreneur spirit. Okay. And this is perhaps one of the most famous pieces of public art, uh, or art in a public place, in Minneapolis. Yeah, it's been around quite a while. I'm not yeah. even sure. Now, an anecdote years, I've heard is that for copyright purposes, one note is incorrect in this. Really? That they had to do that to protect copyright. I, it, that may just be a, uh, an anecdote, but I don't know. And th this is sort of whimsical. I know down on South Nicollet, uh, on the side of, I believe, an apartment building, you can see these images from the Monopoly game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure who uh, was responsible for funding that particular mural. Could have been private owner. And this is a, the, that very last image that, that just went off. There is a brand new mural on the, I understand, the side of the Cricket Theater. Right. And I haven't even seen it yet. I no, I haven't either. park and walk down there every day when I come to work, but I haven't seen that. Mm. So it's happening. I mean, there's lots of, there are murals, there are old sculptures, new sculptures. Uh, what is the condition of a lot of these? Obviously, the Arts Commission is taking responsibility to, keep their works uh, refurbished and in good shape and dusted off. As someone who's looked at most of the art in Minneapolis, 
What kind of shape is it in? Well, uh, frankly, we just started the conservation program. We wrote a policy, and that's um, going to be going through city council for a public policy. And we're working on conserving all the pieces. For example, Ole Bull, um, he's missing his, his bow, as I mentioned. He's also suffering from bronze corrosion. And this is a serious um, threat to all of our bronze works, the, the elements, the acid rain, the pollution. Um, it's, it's a real deteriorating factor for these sculptures, and um, we're working on getting some money to repair it. So it, it can be fixed, yeah. but it takes mm -hmm. money. Yeah, it's quite expensive when you let bronze works go for that long of time. They've never been waxed or cleaned. Um, you know, and you're talking about pieces that are 60 to 100 years old, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a serious thing. We need yeah, to I look into I think the data it. on Oli Bull was 1897. Mm -hmm. So, and it's just been left in the elements this right. long. Mm -hmm. Will it look different once it's cleaned up? I notice it has that sort of green patina. Yeah, yeah it will look different. Um, it, it will. I don't know exactly what it's going to come okay. out like. But. Well, we've got another minute or two, and I wanted to ask you if, if, from your point of view, with the Arts Commission or in general across the country, are there any trends happening in, in what the public might see out in the public area in terms of again, public art, mm -hmm. uh, are we going to see more bus benches, are we going to see large sculptural things or more murals, or what's your sense of what's going on out there? Uh, yeah, public art is definitely becoming um, a bigger thing. People are very interested, they want, they want to make their cities more livable, more interesting, and um, mm -hmm. it's, it's growing, it's a growing field. How about uh, funding for it? How, uh, how do these things get funded? Uh, well, uh, through the city's program, it comes out of 1% uh, of the capital net debt bond sales, and uh, which this year was $155,000. Um, then you take out staff expenses, and you have to have some maintenance endowments going on. And you know, it, it's, a, it's not a lot of money for the kinds of things we're doing, but it, it's, it's there. It's, you can notice you, it. Yeah, you notice And I suppose it. it takes some cooperation between the Arts Commission and different parts of the mm -hmm. city bureaucracy that needs to right. maintain and place these things. Right. The interagency um, work that we do is very important to educate city officials, people from the Park Board, Public Works, the Council, um, on what needs to happen um, when something needs to be restored. That was a big issue, um, th you know, to, to get them educated on what is public art and why we need it. Okay. Well, Jan Marlies, it's been really interesting to hear about what you do in the Arts Commission's work and all the art out in the neighborhoods and downtown in Minneapolis. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Great. And thank you for joining us. If you want information on, on the public art in Minneapolis, or uh, more about the University of Minnesota Press, you can call the Arts Commission at 673-3006. And at the very end of the show, there'll be a select calendar of some events coming up this month. And thank you for watching Artifacts. We'll see you next time.